Hello everyone, uh, sorry about the delay, um, I've just come off the back of a podcast which ran a little bit late, um, but I'm here now and I have a guest with me, uh, Vicky Joy Anderson. So let me just share the screen so we can see what's going on here. There we go guys, we're here now and uh, I've got the chat up on the side. Hello everyone, uh, sorry about the delay, <laughs> um, I've just come off the back of a podcast which ran a little bit late. Um, so that's what I sound like, lovely, right. <laughs> I'm going to close that and uh, yeah so you guys can see the screen I've got the chat there I'm going to pop the chat out so that's nice and visible on the side with our little conversation there I can't do both at the same time typical never mind then <laughs> technology eh? there's always something there's always something isn't that right Vicky yeah you're oh man you're telling me <laughs> nothing ever goes right uh, but everyone's laughing at me now being technologically inept and able to just do the most basic of things uh, right I've, I've sussed it there we go I've sussed it we've got both going we've got the chat going as well that's great uh, he says no I've not sussed it I've ruined it there we go right we're good we're going everyone can see everything yep screens being shared lovely right so um those who have been following my uh, my recent live talk I discussed how I want to make a video discussing the spirit realm and uh, rather than me just talking into the air for an hour about all my crazy ideas and perspectives on the matter, I thought, why not have a conversation with an expert and see what they have to say as well? Hopefully, we can have a bit of a back, back and forth. And uh, yeah, let's see what we can come up with, Vicky. So you, you are somebody who has been studying the nature of, of spirit beings and those who dwell in this realm. You have your own book about the matter. So I want to ask you before I start, what do you think it is? What do you think the spirit realm actually is? So some context, how does it operate with our world? Yeah. What is it exactly in terms of compared to our world? Where is it? Let's go through the, the whole, the, all the W's, you know, what's your, from your experience, from the testimonies you've heard from people who experience entities in these realms? Yeah. What's your take on the matter? So to start out right out of the shoot, fire hosing everybody, there are very cliche areas where our mind always goes when we think of like, okay, where are the demons or where are the entities? And some people will say hell, some people are more sophisticated. They would say Tartarus or the abyss. Some would say, you know, the second heaven or the astral plane. Uh, I would contend that uh, spiritual entities, um, if, if we're talking just the negative ones, I believe that we know from the book of Enoch and the book of Peter that there are entities, probably fallen watchers, in the abyss that in the Hebrew that's Tartaru or Tartarus. We've got um, the literal underground. You know, are there underground bases, et cetera, et cetera, depending on where you fall in that realm of conspiratorial information. We uh, likely have nefarious beings of an extraterrestrial nature there as well. Uh, but I also believe that they are in the high places of Ephesians 612, and we can talk about that. I think that they are also here in the terrestrial plane on Earth. And the fifth place I think that they are, and this is going to be somewhat controversial perhaps to some people, is I believe that there are fallen entities in the third heaven and in the throne room as well, uh, based upon what we know about the divine council, which is something completely different than angels or demons or greys or watchers. This is sort of like the galactic federation of heaven where there is a represent representative sitting at the table of every class of being adam once sat on that divine council when he fell he gave up his seat so to speak jesus took that seat later and we we get this from psalm 82 but we also get it from strange passages that a lot of pastors preach erroneously on there is a passage in first or second kings i believe where uh, Ahab is wreaking havoc and the divine council is meeting in heaven and they're coming up with a plan for how to thwart his, his evil plan. And a lying spirit comes forward and says, I will go down and be a lying spirit in the mouth of Ahab's advisors. He'll take their advice, he'll take this bad advice and then, you know, we'll one up them. 
And so this is very distressing to our our compartmentalized theological minds because why is there why is there an angel in heaven who gets a seat at the table with Yahweh making choices and intervening in in earthly affairs and why is Yahweh giving the thumbs up to a lying spirit this is very complicated but uh, we know from uh, Psalm 82 Dr. Michael Heiser has done a lot of work on this and unpacking this difficult passage in his book The Unseen Realm but there is a difficult passage that is translated rather poorly in the English translations. In the Hebrew, it says, it, it, God, uh, Almighty Creator, God, Father of Jesus Christ, is speaking in the verse. And it, it says, I have said of you, you are gods, but you will die like men. Something to that effect. And so in the Hebrew, it says, Elohim, capital E says to the Elohim, lowercase e, uh, you you will die like men. And so the word Elohim is the word where in English it's translated God. Now, interestingly, Elohim is always a plural word. The I am ending in Hebrew is the plural. So in English, we would add an S or an ES to make something plural. In the Hebrew, if you see an I am ending, it means plural. So uh, best example that's going to be uh, understandable to everybody in a moment is cherub is one angel. Cherubim means there's a bunch of them. So uh, Elohim is always plural. And a lot of people want to explain that away very nicely by saying, well, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, so he's plural. But monotheism is really, I think, misunderstood by the modern culture. We think that monotheism means one God exists. But if you went into antiquity, if you're in the culture and the context of the scriptures, that was written in a time where most of the nations of the world were polytheists. They, they worshipped many, many gods. So when the Jews said that they were monotheistic, they weren't saying that they no longer believed that these other gods that were, they were interacting with existed. What they were saying is, we choose to only worship one god. And so in Psalm 82, it corroborates that. It says, God, capital G, says to the to the lowercase g's, you will die as men. And uh, going back to your initial question of where are these things, where do they exist, this is where modern English-speaking Americans and people who are, are married to the English language and don't understand the Hebrew culture, the Hebrew language, uh, the Hebrew logic. Um, they don't think in step logic like we do. We think chronologically. We think in an order of 1 to, to 10 or A to Z. This is not the way ancient Semitic people thought. They thought in parallelism and they thought in block logic. So if a writer in Hebrew was going to sit down and write down, like if they were going to write down the events of the recent Maui fires, here in America, we would say at 10 a.m., smoke started rising, and at noon, these people started fleeing the house. That's not the way a Semitic writer in antiquity would write. They would block everything together. They would explain um, all of the aspects of the fire. And then they would explain all of the aspects of like the people who are on the ground, their testimonies. And they, they would group it according categorically according to the areas of the, the different things that happened. And so when we hear the word Elohim, we think God, we think one guy, nobody else gets that title. And if anybody else says that they're an Elohim, they're a liar, they're a wolf in sheep's clothing, et cetera, et cetera. But the word Elohim in scripture, and this will blow your mind if you start reading the scriptures with this understanding, the word Elohim in Hebrew doesn't mean Almighty Creator Yahweh God. It is a generic pronoun that means anything that exists in the spiritual realm. And God exists in the spiritual realm, so he's an Elohim. Jesus exists in the spiritual realm, so he's an Elohim. But the fallen angels and the watchers and the ascended masters and uh, all of these, these fallen things, anyone in Sheol, anyone who has died, in the Hebrew mindset, they're an Elohim. Now, the reason why this isn't controversial, if you're willing to accept the, the cultural context of that word is, 
when when i say human being you understand that i'm talking about anyone male female of any age living on planet earth it, human being is a designation of what inhabits the terrestrial realm and so when we say elohim or in the english god what we mean is anything not inhabiting the terrestrial realm they're inhabiting the spiritual realm so there's differentiations of course so when i say i'm a human being and the king of england says he's a human being we know that there's distinct distinctions in class between the two of us there's distinctions in power there's distinctions in authority there's distinctions in how much respect and money and wealth that that is being received but we're both human beings no one would argue well some people would argue yeah. but you know yeah. what i'm saying <laughs> so um all that to say we have to understand that these Elohims, uh, which you can call demons or watchers or fallen angels or alien greys or reptilians or Nordics or whatever you want to call these things, that they are all inhabitants of another dimension, which makes them Elohims. Uh, we know that they are created by God, so they have a lesser rank. And we know that because of their rebellion, they will one day die like men. So in other words, because you left your first estate, because you rebelled, and in the end, you're going to have the same fate as these bottom of the wrong deplorable eaters on, on planet Earth, right? So that's a, a long-winded answer to your question, but I think that they inhabit many spaces, Paul. The one distinction I'm going to make is that if you go uh, with the definition of demon that is in the Book of Enoch, the Dead Sea Scrolls, in rabbinical literature. A demon is the disembodied spirit of the Nephilim, which were the demigod offspring of the Watchers. And I believe that to, for the most part, demons, because they have the mitochondria DNA, they have, they have human DNA in them, that they are sort of relegated to this realm now does that mean that the demons are never taken into the astral or they can't i don't know how to answer that i'd love for someone smarter than me to answer that but i believe that the that the the shadow people and the hat men and the hags and the people that show up in our bedrooms and the ghosts and the familiar spirits i think a lot of them are demons and the reason why they have such easy access to us is because they are also terrestrial beings that makes sense. That was a that was a great answer, by the way. <laughs> like that was <laughs> that was a wealth of information just thrown at me there that I I, I hadn't even contemplated. Um, yeah, this has gone way deeper than I was uh, prepared for. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. No, that's good. That's brilliant. So what you're kind of saying is um, the spirit realm isn't just one place. It's it's a it's a multifaceted, pocket dimensional, many layered thing where different classes of entities with different levels of spiritual form reside basically it's a, so. it's a, it's a hierarchy of, of spiritual realms so let's let's start let's start at the bottom let's work okay. through the, let's work through the layers okay so the ones we can relate to the most is our realm the earth in a sense i do believe where we live where we inhabit is spiritual in nature i think it is yeah. it is one of the realms of spiritualism it's obviously yes. the realm of matter the realm of form and shape um the realm of mass let's say um and i i think our bodies as much as they are physical they are ethereal as much as physical the whole science kind of proves it all atoms are empty space blah 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 all that all the usual you know quantum physics stuff that people go into to try to explain that you know we are essentially frequency of vibration vibrating into solid mass aren't we so we we ourselves are spiritual beings i think a lot of people forget that especially christians as well i think that's where the whole gnostic thinking can start slipping in when you forget that principle the idea that we are a a soul that's trapped in an evil flesh prison by a cruel and vindictive demiurge god who you know wants us in this prison planet physical world of of flesh and lusts and desires that we need to free ourselves from in some way that's kind of denying god's creation basically and you know we are spirit beings we are a soul. We are a living soul in a, in a body, basically. You know, and it's always, we're not separate from one another. I think a lot of people think, you know, like, we're like driving the meat puppet type of thing <laughs> within us. And it's not, that's not how it works. 
it's linked the spirit and the body are one in that sense i think i think people need to kind of that's my interpretation of it. that's what i've kind of learnt and that's kind of the lowest level of spiritualism is probably that right if, if you want to go in the hierarchy what do you think we where do you think we actually land in it is there anything below us is that perhaps where the demons are are they in a lower level to us okay this is a great question so we know from the scriptures well we always start there as the foundation we know from the scriptures and the psalms it says that we were created a little lower than the angels okay and i believe angels in the classic greek definition angelos right it means messenger so that the angels are actually i think really low on the totem pole in heaven now this doesn't mean they're treated poorly and they are without respect but the they basically work in the mailroom they are messengers mm. and then we have archangels who are a little you know they're the supervisors right so you've got um uh, michael and gabriel obviously in the book of Enoch lists two others and um but then you've got a whole bunch of angels that that aren't listed by name and aren't told about and i think people in the past you know in the 70s i think billy graham even tried to write a book on angels and there's anyone who tries to write books on angels in heaven it, it just by nature of what's in scripture you have to start to become speculative and so i think it's fair to say that I think that there are a whole bunch of spiritual beings that we know nothing of. And maybe we don't need to know uh, wh whatever the reason is, but I think that they're there. And I think that there's also a large range of fallen angels and fallen beings and fallen entities. But I'm also not sure, Paul, in kind of the mess and chaos of all the disclosure and disinformation that we're sort of all getting inundated with, I do believe that some of these fallen creatures might be created, not necessarily by God, but created by these entities, whether whether through hybridization or cloning or some sort of bastardized experiment in technology or whatever. But I, I think certain classes of greys and other things were probably, you know, chimeric sort of, of experiments. So there's all that sort of thing now by way of are human beings the lowest i tend to think so and i'm not talking about but th we've got to specify this when god looks down on us we're we're sinful but the ranking that if, if you're looking at this in terms of god doesn't isn't bound to time so he sees an eternal perspective so if you look at it in in the perspective of when he looks at us he sees our ultimate future the scripture says that we're going to be high priests and we're going to rule and reign with him you know whatever that means so i think that our the rank we have now is not our eternal rank and so uh, just because we might be lower than the angels this is where, especially in America, where feelings and emotions have to get wrapped up in everything. And feelings and emotions can really destroy sound doctrine and, and theology and exegesis. And so we have to understand that low rank doesn't mean unimportant, unintelligent, unappreciated, or unloved in the eyes of God. It doesn't mean we don't have a very special purpose. So by way of the angels, we're, we're beneath the angels. and by way of just power and abilities, even the fallen angels obviously have powers and capabilities beyond us. And I think that human beings were initially meant to be naive and trustworthy. Like if you think of a, a dumb animal like that just trusts you to the point where it, it's going to walk right into a trap or it's going to walk right into the, the arms of the butcher. Or you think of, of a child who's going to take the candy in, in the back of the van, that kind of thing. You know, we have adopted the fallen realms definitions of, of something. So when we look at a child or an animal, we think stupid, dumb, naive, simple-minded, you know, and we think that the, the pinnacle of humanity is the point where we get PhDs and we're running companies and it, we're getting that 
identity from the fallen world. I think that if all of a sudden planet Earth, if we turned into the Garden of Eden, three false specimens that God initially intended us to be, we would we would be ashamed to be that because we now think that we it's about power and hierarchy and intelligence and wealth and degrees and stature. And I think that God initially intended us to be very simple, naive, and just trusting like little children. And so uh, I think that by way of our ranking that I think we rank very high in value if the definition of value is God's. Mm -hmm. We rank very low in value if we're going to the definition of those who have eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so uh, you pose a good question as to whether where we rank with, with the Nephilim. They're disembodied. They, they're half human, half watcher. So because they're half watcher, they have an advantage, but because they've lost their bodies, we have the advantage. That's that's a tough call for me. That's a coin toss for me. Well, well, uh, first of all, what you said about there about the human beings kind of being born to be naive in a sense, but I think it's more like this: the whole sheep analogy. Um, you know, we're, we're the flock for Jesus, essentially. You know, and he tends to his herd, and we are the sheep. And you know, he's 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 a caring shepherd. That's the idea. I think it, it's not meant to, in a degrading way when you say that. No, the idea no, it's more no, it's, it's, it's the good it's the good chef you know what i mean yeah self-sufficiency versus uh god is the shepherd i like that analogy so we are always striving to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps fix our own problems be the problem solver and when you, when you look at verses like uh when we are weak he is strong that's that's the kind of weakness i'm talking about yeah yeah. So in terms of this uh, whole and the Nephilim question as well, because I was thinking if if we are in this realm, which we call the physical realm, let's, let's just call it that. I don't know. I don't know what God calls it. <laughs> sure. but, you know, but to us, it's it's our world. It's where we exist consciously in a body embodied with our senses, our hands, our, our ability to interact with. This is our experience, you know, but then people who take psychedelic drugs in this form seem to visually gain access to something else okay and yes. the common belief for most ignorant people who are doing these things is that they're going somewhere special they're going to a place outside of this world a higher level of consciousness or a higher plane the astral plane the fractal realm numerous names describing the exact same place now this is the place where they see jesters dmt machine elves disembodied forms of, of a sort, you know, um, but that seem to have a consciousness. And they, they seem to take many shapes and sizes, but a common one is something like a humanoid-ish type shape with multicolored fractal patterns and designs, something akin to what we would call a jester from our understanding and descriptive. The words we have is jester, you know. But there's something there that clearly thinks, it communicates, it tells you something. And I, I am not one to believe the Jungian archetypical angle where it's all just reflections of the collective human conscious giving us archetypical symbols to represent whatever, you know, just I think they are literal physical entities with consciousness, agendas, thoughts and feelings and, and a life. You know, I think that actually they have a reason for being there. It's a whole history, which we're not going to get into today fully. We'll touch on it because that's a whole episode in its own right. But they're there for a reason, you know, and they existed in physical form once but here on earth with us. So in a sense, it's where they are, not 3D. Is it 2D, essentially? Is it like what, what I think Alpha Talks is making a video on this concept, but it's something I've understood for a while. It's that where they are as, as disembodied, it's not 3D. And what you see with your eyes while you're there is a flat image, essentially, that just moves like a kaleidoscope, and they're within it. They are, they are one less dimension than us in that sense, I believe. That feels like what it is from a visual perspective. And if they don't have a body to interact with this world, they are still here in this world with us, just behind that illusory veil of some kind. Are they in some way, basically in the in the walls of our universe, in the pipes where all the, the workings that we don't see to make this reality happen, are they there? 
are they in the code that projects this world? Are they the ghost in the machine is a good uh, analogy for that, you know? But where they want to be is right here with us now in this realm. Is that place not a place where you're experiencing something wonderful and magical and mystical and beyond perception? Are you actually going to a lesser realm where beings inhabit it who have been downgraded from this realm, essentially? Is it something akin to a Sheol or a Hell, essentially? an underworld yeah you know mm -hmm. yeah yeah okay so many thoughts with that when you were talking about the 2d which makes total sense to me uh the fact that they are trying to lure and seduce and woo and groom us into their world uh it's not because i think about it if this is a fallen realm who is in a prison dimension because they left their first estate if everything that we know to be true about how much Satan hates us because he lost his position of favor and power, and now God's giving it to a bunch of deplorables with weak flesh and sin, like there, there's, you know, some major rage issues going on there. The, the concept that the people that dwell in these high places, and I hope we'll get into Ephesians 6.12 because it describes that realm, to think that these these entities that once lived in the presence of God and they were thrown out of their garden of Eden as well. To, to think that they were downgraded into a lesser dimension and that they somehow want to share some beautiful, wonderful thing with, with their enemies, which Ephesians 6.12 says that our enemies are not flesh and blood. They're, they're these creatures and beings that live in this realm. So if there are enemies, the idea that they have some gift to give us, they are going to impart knowledge or they're going to give us freedom, peace, light, love, the answers. Like, why would they do that to their to their enemies? Because if they were loving their enemies, they would be uh, obeying the highest law, which is to, to love others, um, to lay down your life for others. They're not capable of fulfilling the greatest commandment when we 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 aren't even even with the power of the Holy Spirit, we fail in this area. What I loved about your 2D analogy, because Hollywood is constantly giving away snippets and, and truth in plain sight clues as to what's going on, is it made me think of that opening scene in Superman 2 with Christopher Reeve, where um, they're on his planet and there's these defectors, much like, you know, Lucifer, and their prison is to be trapped in this uh, plate of glass, and they're stuck in, in this glass that's whipping through the universe, and so I wonder if that is some sort of caricature for this 2D world that they have been mm -hmm. they have been trapped in. And, you know, you, you put something in a movie and you put some beautiful orchestral music behind it and everything just seems fictional and uh, makes the writer of that film and that director look like geniuses for their creative minds. But they're, they're, the reason they're so easily able to churn out hundreds and hundreds of movies a year is because they're basically getting this stuff dictated to them from, from the astral realm and the the Hollywood movies. I always say that if you want um, the gospel of Jesus Christ, you go to the Bible. And if you want the Gnostic gospel of the fallen ones, you go to a movie theater. <laughs> yeah, that is true. That is very true. Um, I was just I was just thinking while you explained obviously this whole glass analogy, and I, I remember that scene. It's been parodied in all sorts of other shows since. You know, it's it's like a classic moment, isn't it? You know, where they're all that there in this glass, kind of just flowing away into the distance. Like maybe they were hinting at something there, perhaps because I I consider the fractal realm. That's I mean this this realm I live is a fractal realm. It's made up of fractals just as much as that one is. It's it's I do believe it is just this world. But it's kind of like our perception of that is very limited now, especially since after the flood. I think when the flood happened and the rainbow was put into the sky, I think that was an analogy for your freak. You can only now see a limited range of light. Uh, Do you understand? I think that's what I think that's what God was hinting at. And it was for our own protection, because now you have these disembodied spirits everywhere that he doesn't want you in talking to and communicating with and seeing anymore after the Nephilim were wiped out. So I think having a limited frequency light band of vision, the, the, what we can see, the, this color spectrum, saves us from having to interact with these entities that are also here. I think, I think in this 
trippy antediluvian time it was highly spiritually charged and the the fractal astral realm was one with this realm you know and the reason I, I, i'm explaining it like this is because I, i've just been looking into aboriginal australian belief systems for my next video and they're talking about the wangina spirits the creation spirits which are just an, an analogy for the nephilim because they were sent by rainbow serpents, which is an allegory for the feathered serpents of North America or the, the dragons or the fallen angels, basically. Um, but they, the Aboriginals have a very strange cosmology. It's very Earth centric. They don't talk about space or anything, but it's they believe all of existence is occurring within a non linear, circular, self perpetuating bubble called the dreaming. Okay, it's extremely complicated to explain. I'm going to try my best, but it gave me some insights into perhaps the nature of spiritualism in this realm. It seems to, it just seems to, I feel like they know something, you know, and they're trying to, they're trying to say it in the limited ways. And even I don't think I have the language to fully explain it because everywhere I try to read about this dreaming, it's so convoluted and so complicated that I still don't fully understand it. But I think what they're getting at is that the past, future and present is all existing within one moment called the dreaming. And they believe that there are spirits on the earth like the Wangina or the Mimis as another example. In fact, there's hundreds of Australian spirits, a lot of them highly vampiric and demonic in nature. I'm not going to lie. Most of them are described as, as vicious monsters. So antediluvian monsters. Think of human-animal hi hybrids. They have their own mermaids called the York Yorks. They have their own flying skeletal vampire monsters um, called the Namorodos. Um, they have these tall, thin, strange, snake-like bodied people called the uh, the Mimis. They have the clown, literally clown-like looking uh, Wangina storm gods and everything. But they also believe they're not only spiritual, they are also physical at the same time. Okay, because it's all happening at once. They still exist today as they did before they died. Simultaneously, they have this. I think they're all incredibly high on the paturi plant all the time. The Aboriginals. No, that's what they do. They, they you have their sacred plant like ayahuasca in in the Americas. It's called the paturi okay. plant. And I think through the nature of constantly being on this plant, they use it in coming of age rituals. It's very important to their culture to pass down the oral traditions and the traditions of their belief systems. But they seem to, I think the Aboriginals see spirits constantly. And to them, it's just as real as a, as a ghost or a spectre. They don't see it. They don't distinguish a difference between physical entities and spirit entities. They're one in the same to them. It's very bizarre, and they apparently Australia is just full of them from an Aboriginal perspective. You know what I mean? And they're just, they're just there, right in front of them. It's like they just see them. They're just there, it's clear as day. But to us, we just we just don't, you know. And I think that explains this dreaming concept they have, where they think things are both spiritual and physical at the same time at all times. But I think that also explains what I was trying to say at the start that even even we are spirits, you know, in an embodied form. But they can't distinguish the difference between the dead Nephilim and the, the living creatures either. They, it's, it's all one. It's all one thing, you know. Um, and it, again, I can't explain it. I, I'm trying here. I'm really trying to explain it with my limited language. But the way they see things, the way they see this realm, they've melded the spiritual and the physical as one thing. It's one thing. There's no distinguishable, discernible difference from either. We in the West see it as two separate things the spirit realm and the physical realm. But I don't think there is a distinguishable difference. Our perception is just highly limited because we're not tripping all the time on psychedelics, basically, like these folk traditions usually are, you know, so I think we're very detached from it. If I was to, to, to basically what I guess I'm saying is, even though we're on the lower level and people think when they take these psychedelics, they're going to a higher level and they're just here with us right now on earth, you know, nothing's changed. I think it's two sides to the same coin. I don't think... So I suppose you could argue then, if I'm saying that, that we too are in hell in a way, <laughs> at a lower level, you know, uh, but, yeah. but that's, that's pure speculation. That's not so saith God or anything. That's just me <laughs> talk, saying stuff, you know, <laughs> but what, what do you think of all that concept of the, of the dreaming, yeah. you know, it's weird. That, that's amazing. And, and the, the fact that they call it the dreaming. Yeah. And, and, you know, I was sort of alarmed. I was kind of, 
you know, reading the word the other day, and I thought, you know, we, we all know that there's certain stories in, in scripture where it's blatantly talking about um, a spiritual encounter during a dream. And so we know that, you know, uh, Jacob's ladder, you know, when Jacob was in Luz and, and he saw the stairway to heaven. And we know that uh, um, Solomon, when he asked for wisdom, uh, that was during a dream, and that that's things that that detail is kind of missing out of a lot of sermons. Um, you know, we kind of esteem Solomon as this extremely righteous, altruistic guy because he could have asked for anything the world. He asked for wisdom. He, that was a dream. You know, uh, that he might have answered differently if he had been wide awake. You know, uh, who knows? But uh, there's interesting details about that. When when Solomon had that dream, he was on the top of a mountain offering sacrifices to a false god. He was practicing the uh, sacrificial rituals of one of his foreign wives, probably. And so he had traveled a little distance from Jerusalem. He was up on this mountain. He offered sacrifices to this, this these false gods, these veils. And then he was asleep on the mountain, and he had this dream. And the real, the one true God, the God of his father, David, appears to him. He chooses wisdom and little detail. When he wakes up, he books it back to Jerusalem. Like the next verse, he is booking it back to Jerusalem and offers all of the appropriate sacrifices in the temple, according to the Torah. So in other words, it's like, what was I doing up on that mountain? I'm going to rectify this. I saw the real God face to face. The real God meaning the pre-incarnate Messiah. That that was probably who he was dealing with. And um, there's a lot of uh, confusion in the Old Testament when, when the English translates it to Lord or God. We always assume it's God the Father. In many, many cases, that that word that we're just reading as God or Lord, if you actually go back to the Hebrew, specifically the Masoretic texts that have the vowel renderings, a lot of times Moses the burning bush, and Solomon in his dream, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they're actually speaking to the pre-incarnate Messiah. They're not talking to God the Father. So anyway, just a little caveat there. So anyway, um, Abraham. When he has the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant is made, where the animals are split in two and they walk through the bloody parts and, and they have this uh, covenant of blood between Yahweh, the pre-incarnate Messiah, and, and Abraham promising that his descendants will be as the stars. Again, most sermons don't include the first parts of the verse. Abraham fell into a deep sleep. So this concept of the dreaming, we associate it as Christians with, okay, sleep paralysis, lucid dreaming, out of body, astral projection. And so we sort of have this negative connotation of the dreaming. But I think that it's something that the enemy has stolen and bastardized for their own purposes. Initially, this, this dreaming, I think, was a way of keeping the lines of communication open between Yahweh and his people when they were thrown from the garden. They no longer walked with Yahweh, they no longer saw him face to face, but he didn't cut off all communication. He didn't say, don't ever talk to me again. And so if you go to obscure verses like Song of Solomon 5.2, uh, where it says the, the bride was asleep, but her heart was awake, and the bridegroom came to the door and knocked, and she didn't want to get up because... She had already, you know, gotten her night clothes on and didn't want her feet to get cold and all this. That that her her that she was asleep but her heart was awake. It's that altered state of consciousness where someone's knocking at the door and she doesn't quite know if it's real or if she's really in her room or not, or is she really asleep? And that to me, as someone who's researched sleep paralysis for years and years and years and encountered sleep paralysis against her will for years and years and years, that verse was so categorically eye-opening for me because instead of looking at sleep paralysis now as this is a bad thing, I mean, I still think that, but instead of looking at it solely as entities are coming and, and tormenting me, it was no enemies, the enemy is coming and stealing something from me. That time of the night was meant where the veil is a little bit thinner and we can have some type of intimacy with God. Now, intimacy, 
doesn't mean something sexual. I'm not talking about intimacy this stuff. And intimacy doesn't necessarily mean paranormal, supernatural, you know, horripilating goosebump flesh where you can wake up and tell a great campfire story because you saw um, the third heaven. I'm not talking about courts of heaven stuff. What I'm talking about is these, these in and out of, of consciousness times when we sleep are opportunities for us to, in our spirit, be in the presence of God and and glean that energy, for lack of a better word, not, not trying to say anything new age here, but what I'm saying is when people in the Bible were in the presence of God or the presence of Jesus, uh, think about Moses. After he came down off the mountain and he'd been in the presence, the people knew he'd been in the presence of God because he had an aura around him. They said, veil your face. We don't want to see the glory of God emanating off of you. In the New Testament, there's a beautiful passage that talks about how we are supposed to have the aroma of Christ. And so I would think that what if when we are in the presence of Christ and then we go into uh, a scenario with other human beings, and I think all of us Christians have had that experience where someone has been in our presence and they just feel safe or they feel joy. They always say, I always love being around you. I, my anxiety levels are down. I love staying at your house. I never, I, I feel so at peace in your home. And we can have the aroma of Christ. And where we get that aroma on us is when we are in his presence. And I think that in these dreaming, uh, the, the dreaming from a biblical perspective, when the bridegroom is knocking on the door and we're receptive to that, and that's why I think that it makes such a it, it makes such a huge difference in what state of mind when we go to bed. Like it says in scripture, not to go to bed angry. If there's any conflict, you you resolve that before you go to bed. And I don't think that that's just you know uh, biblical counseling 101. Like you know, don't be mad at your spouse. It's not good. I think what 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 it's what it's trying to convey there is that. Uh, when we go to bed, we're going to take with us into the dream world and into the waking hours what we were meditating on. So if we're meditating on movies and rock music and, you know, all this stuff right before we go to bed and we're sucking up all that blue light, if we are in a state of rest, if we are in a state of preparation, we're meditating on the word of God, we're going into our times of sleep with an anticipation and a desire to be in his presence, whether we're consciously aware of it or not, that when we wake up, we are we are filled with that then. Our, our cup is, is full, filled back up. And so I think that one of the things that I've been kind of trying to do through my research is getting people who suffer from sleep paralysis to move away from measuring the success of this by way of when my sleep paralysis goes away, I'm good. That's half of what we as believers are trying to achieve. We don't just want the shadow people and the old hags and, and the, the hat men to go away. We don't just want the anti-bridegrooms to leave us alone. We want that threshold, that liminal space in our actual bedroom and that liminal space in our mind's eye, we don't just want the anti-bridegrooms to not show up. We now want the real bridegroom to show up. And so in order to get the real bridegroom to show up, we have to invite him. It's the same. It's not just the rules for ghouls. We're invitation. You know, we think of it in terms of if you invite a bad spirit in, there's an attachment. But we also have to invite the real bridegroom in. He's not a thief. He doesn't barge in through some other way. He comes in through the front door, through the front gate, John 10, and he comes in because he's been invited in. Revelation 3.20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and answers the door and lets me in, I will come in. So there's three things we have to do before he comes in. And Revelation 3.20, I don't think 
that that has to do with praying a prayer and now I'm going to start going to church and living my best life now. Revelation 3.20 is the cipher for getting into the proper dream world at night, getting into the proper dimensional space, mm. getting into the realm of where we're touching base with that spirit part of who we are, like you were talking about. And when we're awake, we're dealing with the physical. When we're asleep, we, we can enter into this dreaming, and it's up to us who we're going to open that door for. Is it going to be the shadow people, or is it going to be the bridegroom? And he's also knocking. But if grandma, you know, uh, the wolf, you know, the wolf dressed up like grandma in Little Red Riding Hood, every night the wolf tries to get to that door and he, he beats Jesus to the door usually and a lot of that has to do with our lack of preparation and if, if all we do when I, I know a lot of people with sleep paralysis just think if I have sleep paralysis I'll cry on the name of Jesus so that's good do that but what guy let, let's say what guy in the army or the marines or the navy what guy in the military is like if somebody starts shooting at me, I'll load my gun. You, you don't start loading the gun after the shots get fired. What happens is you go to boot camp. You learn how to hold that weapon. You learn how heavy it is. Uh, you learn how fast it takes to draw it, how, how many rounds are in it, how quickly the rounds are expelled. You learn how to shoot it. You learn how to aim it. And so then when the bullets fly, bam. And we don't do this in the spiritual war that happens at night. We go to bed, we hope for the best, and if we have sleep paralysis or a nightmare, I'll call on Jesus. But it's almost too late then. You're already stuck in the paralyzation. And so what we have to do as Christians is, first and foremost, we have to start longing for seeing Jesus instead of those things. And so a lot of us are content to just go to bed and get a good night's sleep. How many of us, and I'm speaking to myself here too, how many of us, when we go to bed and everything from the day is on our mind, everything from the next day is on our mind, we're juggling everything on our to-do list, we don't feel good, we're tired, we just caught a glimpse of ourselves in the mirror and we were reminded we got to lose 10 pounds and uh, everything, the kids are screaming and we we just get lazy at, the, at after dinner. This is my time. I want to relax. I don't want to study doctrine and theology and memorize and meditate. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I just want to, you know, curl up in front of my black screen, right? That's where we, most of us go. So the, the first obstacle uh, to getting rid of sleep paralysis, getting rid of the, the, the dream renderings, all this is we as Christians have to come to grips with the fact that where, where our hearts are, our treasures are, and if whatever we're meditating on all night before we go to bed, that's where our heart is. That's our treasure. So the number one goal really is, how do I make Jesus Christ my treasure? Because if he's not our treasure, we want the same things that the New Agers and the occultists and the agnostics and the atheists want. We want a good night's sleep. And we don't want to be traumatized and terrorized by demons. Like nobody wants to be attacked in their sleep and be scared to death and wake up the next day tired and unprepared. So where we really have to start, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you as well. And it's really easy in conversations about astral projection and sleep paralysis to talk about confess your sins and get rid of all the items in your house that might be charged. And, and I'm not saying don't do those things, but you can get rid of everything in your home. You can live in a studio apartment without a stick of furniture. And you can read your Bible all day long because you think, it, it, but if all this is is a formula to get rid of sleep paralysis, that is not the goal of the Pilgrim's Walk. Our goal is for Jesus Christ to be our treasure. And when he becomes our treasure, these things flee. And, and let me tell you, when you're not walking with the Lord, there are plenty of people with sleep paralysis that cry out on the name of Jesus and, and the, the situation ends. But let me tell you, when you are walking with the Lord and you are a child of God and you're the apple of his eye and you have intimacy with him and your heart leaps a little inside when you open the Bible 
and, and you've got that, that relationship with them, when those sleep paralysis entities come, all you have to do is start opening your mouth with the J sound on your lips. And they're terrified because they're like, oh no. <laughs> and, and I have been on both sides of this, Paul. In, in my youth when it's like, okay, I go to church and I'm not doing anything like bad. I'm not, you know, doing the whole drug, sex, rock and roll thing, but I'm really not interested in Jesus. Like he's kind of boring in comparison to my own pursuits and my own dreams. I, I would have sleep paralysis and I, Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me. And I would have to fight with these things. It was like an arm wrestling battle. And as I got older and as I got closer to the Lord and more serious about knowing the word and loving him these sleep paralysis experiences last about a millisecond and i actually come out of these things rejoicing and laughing because you see the terror on these things faces which which makes you realize who in the world is this jesus christ that the most terrifying thing in my realm of existence wets their shorts within one syllable of even covering his name. And it just brings focus and attention to how, how we have not even begun to fathom the beauty and the glory and the power of Jesus Christ and the, the weapon that we wield, not when we just know his name, and not just when we call on his name, but when that name is special to us because, it, you know, it's it's a family that we've been adopted into. And I could go on and on. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. But um, I, I'm just thinking about Psalm 91. Everybody quotes Psalm 91 as their golden ticket to how these things can never harass them. The terror by night and, and the terror by night cannot bother me. He'll charge his angels concerning me. He'll lift them, me up on their hands. I'll, I'll crush the lion and the adder. And what people don't see is they don't recognize verse 9, that all of those promises about the, the terror by night and crushing the, the enemy's head comes to people who have made Yahweh their dwelling place. And this is all about thresholds again. This is all about betrothal covenants. When you make Yahweh your dwelling place, it means... When you are betrothed to the bridegroom, he brings you into his tent and he does a blood covenant. He does a threshold covenant with you where he swears to shed his own blood to protect your life, which he did on the cross. So for those who have made Yahweh their dwelling place, but that means we have to be living inside the tent. So every time we get bored inside the tent, because, you know, God's kind of boring and all these other things over here are glittering like gold and these things are more exciting. Every time we step over that threshold outside of his tent, all of the promises of Psalm 91 are on hold. And so it is being within that dwelling place of Yahweh where the protection of the terror by night becomes something that we can access. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I mean, you were talking about obviously this this dream element. That obviously, it, from what we get in terms of spiritual realms, is the dream realm then another dimension of a spiritual realm? I don't think it's the fractal realm. I don't think it's where the Nephilim are. Uh, it it seems like the dream, the dream world, um, maybe the next step up. Like I said, it's that intermediary level for us to get just closer to God, on some level, a place where He can communicate with us more readily though i do it does seem like uh, malevolent entities do have the ability to get there first in that realm it's also inhabited in a sense uh, but it also seems that the dream realm to me seems like a highly personal place as well it's like a pocket realm a pocket dimension for us our own our own abilities and, and imaginations and perceptions is a place we create i don't think it's like a place multiple people are flying around when they dream at night and they can all bump into each other it doesn't feel like that's what it is it seems like a direct line to some or something or like say there was a, a tunnel to heaven from earth we're in that tunnel but we're not we haven't gone through it that's kind of the dream realm or something i'm trying to come up with some analogy for what it is here based on this this theorem we're coming up with of levels you know um <laughs> But I'm not, again, it's dream. I, I'm a, I'm an avid dreamer. I always have been. Like I I have some crazy dreams every single night. 
And I, there's no fear in them anymore. The, I used to have nightmares um, before I was saved. I used to yeah. be attacked. I'd, I'd, I'd be paralyzed with a massive, huge spider legs coming down slowly towards my chest type of thing, you know, and I'd have to wrench myself out of it, screaming and sweating profusely. I'd, I'd have nightmares regularly. I'd dream of horrible things happening to me that I had no control over, you know. Um, being jump scared as well was a big one that would literally make me just feel like my soul left my body. It was that so much fear would suddenly happen that I, I would I would scream in the dream to the point where I would be silent. You know, and the, I've, it's like this thing was making me so scared on purpose just to just to suck the life out of me in that moment. You know, looshing is probably a good word for it, isn't it? Or something like that. Um, yep. But but and I had a moment in waking life where the room collapsed all around me and darkness started to seep in from the edges, you know, and it felt like I was dying. And calling on the name of Jesus saved me in that moment, you know, and I've never had to do it since because that proved to me the power in his name. And I think that was the day I was truly filled with the Holy Spirit and my faith was edified then, you know, and, you know, since I am who I am now, years after this, I haven't had any of that. And I have dreams every night and I'm exploring. I'm exploring cities. I'm exploring lands, places, people. Um, and there's no fear, you know, and it's not like I'm in control necessarily, but it's a narrative playing out and I'm within the narrative in my dreams now, the more, the more learning experiences than, than nightmares, if you get what I mean. It's not like stuff doesn't happen in them. That's not weird and would be, could, could be considered scary to somebody, you know, but it's like, there's no, there's no fear about it. It's more of a, like, like watching a film now. I'm separate from it in a sense in that way. Yeah. You know, it's it's exactly. it's a different experience now. Dreaming is, and I dream every night, and it does feel it feels like there's something to it. Um, yeah, but late lately, actually, yeah, one problem I've had with my dreams. Maybe you have some insight into what this is, but I have been waking up feeling like I haven't slept, like I have ran a marathon, even though I know I've been dreaming and I know I've been asleep. I'm waking up exhausted. Like everything I did in the dream, I actually physically did. <laughs> Do you get what I mean? My body felt every bit of it. Yes. What's that about? What's going on there? I've experienced that most of my life. And it took me forever to put two and two together that the reason I could sleep eight, nine, 10, 11 hours, you know, I, I, I thought it was a thyroid issue or something, you know, and you do, you start exploring all these physical things. Like, is this some sort of narcolepsy or am I not getting into REM or whatever? And I finally concluded after decades of trying to, to figure it out that when we are engaged in this other realm all night, even if our physical body is still in bed, all the parts of us that are being regenerated when we sleep, our mind, our emotions, our spirit, that part has, has exited and not in every dream. I'm talking about these astral things. And so I think that they do come back exhausted because they haven't gotten the rest you know i say they you know but like those aspects of, of our physiology have not been rested they've been active it's kind of the same thing as like you know the foxhole mentality where these soldiers would stay up all night after night after night in the foxhole and they'd go insane and it's interesting and i've never done this but if you study the full mental uh, state of people that are tormented in their sleep, you know, harassed night after night after night. And you studied people that had the box hole, like that, that sort of insanity. I wonder how many parallels there would be between the two with the link being, you've got two people who never go to sleep for real. Terrifying. Someone's asked a very inter interesting question, actually, just in the chat. And um, they said here, I get those vivid nightmares. So the ones I was describing, why does cannabis suppress it? And this is something actually pers from a personal experience, you know, I would heavily medicate myself with cannabis for eight years of my life. I'm talking, yeah. I'm talking five a day, every day, you know what I mean? Just to keep myself in. being sober was a trip for me. It was the other way around, yeah. you know, normality for me was being high and I didn't dream. I had eight years where I didn't dream. Okay. It switches it off. It's as simple as that. But when I came off the cannabis, 
I was overwhelmed with the amount of extremely powerful, vivid dreams I was having every night, just as real as this life. You know, it's kind of like waking up thinking you've had your entire day, then waking up again and realizing you've done nothing. You've just woke up, you know. Something about cannabis does just switch off the dream. And I do think it must impact you severely to not dream for so long, you know, and, and I feel like yeah. I feel like I must have done some damage to myself. Luckily, everything seems to be working now. I've been sober off, off cannabis for at least six years, eight years, maybe now for a while, you know. But Fred here is saying, you know, he gets those vivid nightmares and I assume he's using cannabis to suppress the nightmares mm -hmm. as well. It, could this be a, a method? Could could the attacking people with such powerful nightmares be a way to get people to continue with their addictions like cannabis? So, you know, what, what do you think? similar vein and Fred um, I'm just I'm speculating off the top of my head here but in other branches of witchcraft and the occult uh, there's entry level things that they that they tempt or that they use as the wooing you know uh, but the reason that they are putting that there isn't because that's the permit. The goal is always to get you deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper down down the rabbit hole, right? But they can't just, the average person isn't gonna sign up for where they're headed. And so sleep paralysis and these astral nightmares, I think are really the entry level step into the world of theosophy and this, this whole reprogramming us to sort of receive the gospel of the astral realm rather than 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 god so what what they used to do in witchcraft well, used to what they, what they still do is they they get you to overstep a boundary that's sort of like eh, it's not really a big deal right but once you overstep that boundary, they have their foot in the door and then they can slowly get you deeper and deeper and deeper in. So what would happen in, um, let's just use this as an example, uh, in, in, in witchcraft, what they will do is they will do some sort of like a basic spell and they will, you know, make something like paranormal happen in your house. So all of a sudden, um, your, your, um, something on your bookshelf is always knocking over and then you notice it's always at 12 34 afternoon like something's happening that's getting your attention and scaring you all you'd have to do if you knew the formula is you know pray in the name of jesus that that house be cleansed and you know by the by the promptings of however the spirit god leads you to pray you can pray with that and be done with it but then what people do is they get scared so they consult a medium or a psychic someone comes in and burns burns sage now you're another level into it because now you've invited another person over the threshold and they've done this ritual and then um the sage opens up another door so now it is maybe a physical malady and like now this thing has has manifested in a physical way so now i'm going to go and get reiki done because i've heard that reiki is the only thing that fixes this particular physical problem so then the physical problem goes away, but it leads to, it's just, it's breadcrumbing us deeper and deeper. So my, my initial thought when you, when you read Fred's question was getting addicted to psychedelics or anything that's affecting our dopamine levels or affecting our third eye or affecting neural pathways in our brain um which like i don't know if marijuana does that i know meth does that there's drugs that will like uh, carve neural pathways in the brain and what it looks like to me is it could be a next level of seduction like first it's these nightmares so now you have a problem like this is the same as in in politics the hegelian dialect they create a problem so they can create the solution but the solution is something you never would have needed to begin with. And now you're in deeper bondage to the government system because now you need these things that they're selling in order to get rid of this and all that. Right. So it's sort of like that Hegelian dialect, but on the spiritual or the cosmic level. They're forcing these nightmares on you. They're traumatizing. They're uncomfortable. They're distressing. They're affecting waking life. 
I found something that helps and it worked. This went away, but now this is opening the door because psychedelics, uh, pharmakia, which is the Greek word for sorcery, but it's where we get our, our word pharmacy because in antiquity, the only people who were taking drugs were sorcerers who wanted to communicate with the spirit realm. Mm -hmm. So they've now graduated you out of the the nightmares into this pharmacia phase and once we're in that pharmacia phase or we're in the astral projection phase it is a grooming where usually through flattery and through the highlighting of spiritual gifts that we've been given uh, they tell us that we are special we're chosen and through that flattery, then we start listening to their knowledge and they start out by giving us knowledge that's true and helpful and helpful and beneficial to us and, and the way that we're perceived. But then eventually it's like any groomer. You get all of the candy and the toys and everything first. And then once you're in the grip, that's when the, the sadistic stuff starts to happen because now you're 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 in their employ so what i would pray about is um the initial discomfort has been alleviated but is my solution even more dangerous to my spiritual and mental health than the initial thing yeah. because one thing i'm noticing um you can if you read all the like books written in the 1800s and stuff in the 1900s on biblical demonology and the, the Unger books and, and things like that. Um, it goes into great detail about the the witch trials and, and how how witches and things were were diagnosed and brought to legal action in, in the, in the 18 and 1900s. And what's interesting to me about that time in history is they they viewed things a lot differently than we do now. And with, with the psychedelics, they saw that as pharmacia. And what, when these, when these stories are being documented, this is another way, all of the human means of like exorcisms and, and, and ways to, to clear spirits and whatever, they're actually getting you deeper and deeper in. And most of these early exorcisms that were done ended in suicide, a uh, an insane asylum, and the person completely mad, lunatic. And and we even get that word lunatic from Luna, lunar of the moon, and you know these moon gods like seen in the, in the book of Joshua and things like that. And so what's um, what's notable about that is that these these clairvoyants and these things when they were um when they were being called in or the exorcists were being called in the person was actually getting drawn deeper and deeper and deeper into it and many of them ended in insanity and if you watch now like on tiktok one of the huge popular trends on tiktok is the um witch talk hashtag, hashtag talking about um reality shifting sometimes they just call it shifting this is sort of the new and improved repackaged in glittery paper for the young folks it's just lucid dreaming and astral projection but it's a whole new kind that's sort of um very specific to where you map out a script and you put the script under your bed and you meditate as you go to bed and you are given um dream worlds like like special made made to order dream worlds where I want to be Harry Potter I want to be Thor you know whatever and so they're accommodating people I'm going to give you all of these dreams you can be whoever you want in your dreams but even as you listen to these reality shifters talk and a lot of them are Gen Z like young kids and they will be explaining with great pomp and, and excitement about how wonderful this is and how exhilarating it is. And they'll give you all the instructions on how to do it. But they'll almost always say something. Their little disclaimer, their small print is, you got to be careful. You got to know what you're doing. Don't do this. Don't do that. And they will blatantly tell you that people who misuse this uh, 
acquire mental illnesses. And so I could, I don't want to go off on a tangent. I could go on and on and on about the biblical implications and the differences between uh, demonization and illness and how they were confused in scripture or a lot of uh, children and people that were brought before Jesus, like heal my son of epilepsy. Um, this, this friend of mine is deaf or dumb. Sometimes Jesus would heal them and sometimes he'd cast a demon out of them. And it's very specific in the gospels. It says that Jesus and that he sent out his disciples to cure all manner of illnesses and cast out demons. They were two separate things, but often it was confusing because the demons would manifest in such a way that the symptoms would mimic a physical or a mental illness, which is so clever. And we're seeing it again today with this massive DSM volume of mental illnesses that gets bigger and bigger and bigger every year. And they have to keep expanding the volumes and coming up with new names of mental illnesses. What's so brilliant about this is when we give permission and invitation to these spirits and entities and they come in and they uh, demonize us, they will mimic physical and mental illnesses so that you will medicate yourself according to those illnesses, which is pharmacia, and it opens up further doors. And the reason that they're mimicking the physical and the mental illnesses is so that you will misdiagnose yourself and you will you will attack it from a physical perspective rather than a spiritual perspective. And it is a shame that there is not departments in our churches these days that take the healing and the differentiation between healing the sick. The, the three things that Jesus empowered his disciples to do after he rose from the dead, he commissioned the disciples. He gave them the power to heal the sick, cast out demons, and raise the dead. So when Jesus rose from the dead and, and put the Holy Spirit on us, those are the three things that we were anointed as a body of, of believers to be able to do. And there's very little of that going on now. There's a little bit in Pentecostal and charismatic movements where you lay hands on people and pray that they be healed and, and whatnot. But we have this ability as believers in God with the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit to cast out demons, to heal the sick, and to raise the dead. And the reason why this isn't happening, I don't think it's because people don't believe it or they're not trying it. We lack the power. We are lacking that connection. And why as a church are we lacking that connection and that anointing? And that, that's the question of the hour there. So anyway, to, to summarize all that up, because I, I went down many tangents there as I usually do, but I think usually what they're doing is they're creating an initial problem and then they're providing you with a solution that's even more deadly. And the more deadly solution will not always rear its head immediately there is a, a, a wait period so that you won't connect the dots. Um, in fact, they'll usually allow the negative side effects to be connected to some other sort of event in your life, so that will get the, the blame for it. These things are highly intelligent. They, they are operatives. They, they are militaristic, and they know what they're doing. They know the human psychology more than we will ever figure out. It's sort of like taking candy from a baby. They know how to lead and woo and manipulate us. And so uh, I say every solution that we find to any sort of spiritual warfare needs to be 100% biblical. Not because unbiblical things don't work, but because only the biblical methods of, of healing is going to get us out without any spiritual attachments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think what what Fred was saying is that he's he's tried to quit cannabis. He's twelve days sober now, um, Great, Fred. and he's have he's been plagued with nightmares. So it sounds to me like this is their way of probably attempting to say, "Well, smoke cannabis, and you won't have the nightmares anymore." It seems yeah. like that's probably yeah. what's going on now. And it's something that did happen to me when I stopped smoking cannabis. I could suddenly dream again, and I'm not going to lie. After eight years of not really dreaming, it's it's overwhelming dreaming again. Like you forget yeah. you forget what it's like. You know, and yes. you realize, I, th I think you, just, you can start to take it for granted if you're an avid dreamer and it becomes trivial, it becomes mundane, you know, it becomes just the norm type of thing. But when you don't dream for so long, then suddenly you do. 
it's terrifying. It's terrifying that we can even create such things. You know, well, it seems like we're creating such things in our mind. Who truly knows? You know, but um, I was I was curious your message there. You know, it it does seem like like I said, people use it as a as a method to keep people addicted to the drugs. So the nightmares is like a problem, and the solution is the cannabis. And the cannabis the main side effect I've noticed is cutting off from dreams. Is that an attempt in itself? Because cannabis is rife right now to cut you off from God's ability to communicate with you, perhaps. Yeah. Could it be something like that? Absolutely. I mean, when we dream, dreaming is a gift. When it's not being hijacked, dreaming is a gift. Not only do the levels of REM and deep sleep refresh us, and certain things are going on in our in our brain, and we're we're getting healing and and in our rest and People will get very sick if they don't ever hit an REM phase. You know, when people don't get to those deep sleep levels, it's also going back to Song of Solomon 5 too. If that is a means of communicating with Jesus, we're, we're forfeiting that as well. But I think another thing too, Paul, as we're talking about this, and I'm finding this line of, of conversation so fascinating, but I also think that being cut off from the dream world is dangerous. It is like, being in a battle in the middle of the night and losing our night vision goggles. So you're still perhaps dreaming. You're probably still dreaming. You're just not remembering it anymore. Mm -hmm. And what I have found is one of the things that kept me in bondage to the sleep paralysis for so long is I never made the connection that sleep paralysis was attached often to astral encounters where I was being pulled into the astral. And I wasn't able to differentiate between that and just a dream. And so you wake up and you're like, well, it was just a dream. Oh, it was just a nightmare. And so because I didn't understand that those astral dreams were real and those things had physical um, consequences, those things were that I was doing and saying and participating in in the astral realm actually had consequences in the physical, there was all sorts of things that I wasn't cutting off or praying against because they were just dreams. And I have noticed lately, Paul, within the last like maybe two months, I have stopped remembering most of my dreams. And when I wake up, I can't remember a thing. And that makes me feel very vulnerable because I know that I'm dreaming because I have, you know, a, a Fitbit that's telling me you had six dream cycles last night. And I'm waking up sometimes with the exhaustion. I'm sometimes remembering a tail end of the, the last dream I was having before I woke up. And that's enough to know that things were happening. So now I have to spend considerable time in the morning praying and saying, you know, if there is something that I'm forgetting and I need to do more with that, will you help me to remember? And my dreams will actually come back to me. Another thing that I pray before I go to bed, because you will tend to remember a dream if you're woke up in the middle of it. And so if you wake up on the tail end of the dream, you'll remember it. But if you have a bunch of dreams and you don't wake up, you're really only going to remember that last one. And so one thing that I've been praying as I go to bed is, Father, if, there, if I am in the astral realm and there are covenants or oaths or agreements being made or I'm being lulled into things, wake me up so that I can do the warfare right there. And that has happened many, many times. Now, one of the ways that I have been testing the spirits, it, this is a really hard question to answer when I'm on podcasts where people aren't believers, because it says in 1 John 4, we should test every spirit to see whether it's from God. And a lot of these spirits that are coming to us in the astral and in sleep paralysis are not of God, but we have to test them. So when a non-Christian asks me, how do I test the spirits? If you start quoting 1 John 4 and Galatians 1, they're like, well, that doesn't mean anything to me, and I don't believe that stuff. So one of the ways that I have started telling people that you can test the spirits to know whether they're good or bad or for you or against you or higher or lower vibrational or whatever your terminology is, um, because there are so many similarities uh, between uh, sleep paralysis and these threshold covenants and these betrothal covenants, I was recently reading a paper where a Jewish scholar was writing about all of the uh, intricacies of the Jewish uh, wedding and betrothal process and all of the uh, 
metaphors that that is to Jesus Christ and to salvation. It was really fascinating. But what was interesting to me and how I applied it to the to what we're talking about now is there's three stages in a Jewish wedding, and they're all conveniently you know alliterated with the, the letter C. So there's the contract or the covenant, which is called the ketubah with the K. There is the consummation, and then there's the celebration. And so the way you know that you are officially married and in covenant with someone in the Jewish realm is your father and um, your bridegroom have signed a formal contract. There's been a, co a marriage covenant is signed. Then sometimes up to seven years later, after the, the bridegroom has gone out and prepared a home and has gotten a job and has the income and he can support the daughter, he comes back and there's a second wedding ceremony and then there's the consummation right uh so they're married after the contract but the, they don't consummate it until the second wedding ceremony and then after the second wedding ceremony there's a celebration and all the family and friends come and they you know eat drink and all that so because there are so many similarities with these sleep paralysis entities and betrothals they're coming to the door, they want over the threshold. Many times once they're over the threshold, what do people report? Some sort of incubus, succubus, astral rape or attack. That's because they're consummating the covenant you just made when you invited them over the threshold. And then once you consummate, there is a celebration. You might not be a part of it, but, but the astral realm is like, we got another one, right? And so, one of the things that I tell people and how you can test the spirits, like how do I know if this was a dream or if I was in the astral, is I ask them, can you find a contract, a consummation, and a celebration? Or can you find two of the three? Because a lot of times the contract, part of the dream is forgotten. In much the same way when UFO abductees come back, they don't really remember what happened. Um, their memory is wiped, so to speak. They're, there are aspects of the sleep paralysis process where you're in the astral, where I believe covenants are being made. And because these things are smart, we don't remember that part. So we don't understand that a covenant or a contract has been made. And so some of the ways that I determine if those three things have happened in a dream is not everything has to be literal. Like the consummation doesn't have to be something sexual. The consummation can be, uh, eating or drinking something that was offered to you, especially if it's wine, tea, uh, if it's cake or bread, these are various salt covenants. A wine is a type of a blood covenant. Uh, the breaking of bread is a salt covenant. It's a stand-in for a blood covenant. And so if, if there is um, any sort of like a ceremony or a ritual, I, I had a dream the other day and it had nothing to do with a wedding or a honeymoon or anything but I was able to clearly metaphorically see that there was a, a contract, a consummation and a celebration. And it fascinated me. And it, it really sort of kind of put, put the thumbs up to the, to, the, to the line of research. And so I think, you know, when you have a, a regular dream and you wake up and you're like, okay, that was weird. I had a dream that my boss was screaming at me because I, you know, didn't get my, uh, paper in on time and and then these dancing pillows came in the room and you know those are just kind of our brains defragging and it's the anxieties of our day coming out in so, as sort of caricatures and these astral dreams they're they're different in many ways and if you've ever had them you understand not only do you wake up exhausted uh, your whole mood can be different. You you can wake up in a depression. You can be struggling with anxiety or paranoia. You can be argumentative or cynical or the, you, you have this sudden disgust of your own family. There's all sorts of turmoil in you. Um, but there's also things in the dream that are different. You know, and you've talked about some of the fractals and the shadows and the two dimensions, but it can also be excessive detail. Yeah. Like, you wake up and you know the hair color and you know what earrings they were wearing and you remember their first and last name and and the conversations you had like our our normal defragging dreams aren't that detailed so there's there's ways to do this but to to test the spirit to know whether or not you have 
entered into some sort of a covenant with these things is to look for the similarities in the dream. If there's any sort of contract or consummation or celebration, is there someone in your dream that is trying very, very, very hard to get you to do something? Hey, just come in this room for a sec. I don't want to. No, just come on. Just, I mean, I have this all the time. There's always these people in my dream that are, are arm wrestling with me, just begging me to try the piece of cake or to just come in this room for a second or, or, or whatever. And a lot of times, I do believe that these are real interactions and there is a reason why they're wanting you to go step over that threshold into that room or there's a reason why they want you to repeat something after them or there's a reason why they want you to eat this food that they're pro-offering to you. And these are the things we have to pay attention to. And when we get up and we evaluate our dreams, unfortunately, especially in the church, the only reason people want to think about or evaluate their dreams is they kind of want to use it as this kind of like biblical fortune telling where what sort of um, promise of wealth and fame and popularity and a spouse coming around the corner kind of thing. Can I clean out? They're looking at it really from a fortune telling or an augury perspective, like my, God's predicting my future for me in my dream. And what we really should be looking for in our dreams in, instead of good fortune is we should be looking to see if we were vulnerable in that dream. And did we partake in anything that could have been a ritual or an oath or a covenant or an agreement? Mm. Was there some sort of a joining together with a spirit or an entity or a person? Did I dream that I married someone? Did I did I dream that I was pregnant? Did I did I dream that I was eating at a banquet table, you know, these sorts of, of grandiose sort of imageries. And rather than taking them literally, like this means I'm going to have a baby, you know, rather than taking them literally, you look at it like, um, have I, have I joined unwittingly against my will in some sort of a covenant with these entities? You know, what, when you were saying all of this about the contract and the, co the consummation and, you know, this, this and covenant as well, the celebration at the end, you kind of, you, you got my head spinning a little bit because I, I remember having a dream, which I've mentioned many times. I've even just told the same dream to Conspiracy Pilled, who just happens to be in the chat right now. He's just come over. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's my Hatman encounter, which I think I've already explained to you as well. Um, and the videos on my channel where I drew it, I drew it out, you know, and I've, I've made it, it visual as to what happened but everything you mentioned was in that in that encounter yeah. so first of all i approached dead relatives who were all sat in victorian garden furniture having a tea party with yeah. with with cake and tea and they're celebrating that i'm there and they're saying come join us it's so good to see you, you know people who have died years ago you know and I do. I drink the tea, you know. And imme immediately, I get a phone call, and it's a voice saying, "Don't think I forgot about our previous conversation. I'm coming for you now." So a contract was made at some point, and I've just consummated the contract by eating. Basically, is what you've just you've explained it to me perfectly. <laughs> you've, everything was mapped out there, basically, and and then he came. He was over the horizon coming towards me and and those relatives were gone it was, it was an empty space now it's a it's a void it was a park full of people having a good time in the sun now it's empty it's gray and he's there coming for me and i had a memory in that dream of another dream where i i made the contract and it was a dream about performing on a stage in some way i don't recall making the contract with him or something but i remembered it was there is where I met him and made a deal or something. But I, I didn't have any recollection of this happening. But I suddenly remembered a dream I had had months ago within this other dream where I got this phone call. It was, it was, the, it, it's a psychedelic experience when you have a dream memory within a dream. You know yeah. what I mean? It's, and it felt, it felt like I wasn't dreaming. The dream was happening to me. Yeah. I was in somebody else's creation. 
and I was in their domain. It wasn't my brain defragging the events of the day that I was creating. I was put somewhere during my sleep state. It was their place, you know, and they tricked me. They trapped me. They got me to eat. And then he comes, you know, and yeah, he didn't get me, but he came close and I woke up, mm. you know, and that, that, that never, never left me that experience. And it was the hat man, you know, it was the hat mm -hmm. man entity with the, with the fedora, purple trench coat, cane, black face, glowing eyes, multicolored ribbons flying off of him in all directions, you know. And I'm just curious, I was just thinking, someone in the comments while you were speaking even said, people see the hat man a lot. So it was already confirming my own thing, you know, and is this hat man the contract maker? Is he like the businessman within the dream world who goes around making covenants with people, making making people sign contracts? And he's like the, the, the officer that has to go and fulfill the contract, knocking on the door, making sure they're fulfilling their end of the bargain type of thing. Is this who the hat man is? I'm just, just a theory, you know? I love that you just said the businessman. Yeah. Because the first time I saw the hat man was when I was probably four or five years old. And I'm assuming I had had some sort of nightmare or something because my mom was in my room and I was scared. And I had said, I said, can I sleep with you and dad? And she said, no. She goes, do you want to sleep with your brother? And I'm like, okay, because I was scared to death. So she brought me into my brother's room and he didn't have his shades down or anything. And so the window was wide open and the full moon was coming in and it streaked this massive thing of light just down the, the a stripe across its room. And lying within the moonbeam was a hat man lying perfectly stiff, like so that he was confined into the beam of light. Hat, brown, pinstriped, gold pocket watch, hat, couldn't see his face or hands. And I remember like thinking in my little head, like, is he wearing dad's suit? Cause you know, this was the seventies and dad had this brown print pinstripe suit. And so I asked my mom, like, you know, who's the guy laying on his floor? And mom just brushed it off and like, oh, it's probably just your dad, which I guess made sense to me at the time, but it sure doesn't make sense to me now. Well, why my dad sleeping like this on my brother's floor would have made sense. But anyway, um, What's interesting to me, to me about how you just said the businessman is my interpretation as a little four-year-old was that my that the guy on my brother's floor was wearing a business suit because it was my dad's suit. And as I got older and people started talking about the hat man and wearing the suit and and you know all this stuff, I always just envisioned this three-piece business suit. Now I've only seen the hat man twice. Both times I saw him, I was wide awake. I wasn't anywhere near bedtime or anything. And a lot of people who see the hat man see him waking. They see him walking down their hallway or in, in the bathroom mirror and things like that. Some people think that he's a harbinger of bad things to come. I don't remember back to the 70s, so I don't remember if his appearance to me those two times correlated with anything negative necessarily. Uh, some people think he's a good omen and he's sent to help us and all this stuff. The hat man is curious to me. Some people say the shadow man is the shadow of the hat man, which again, sounds good on paper, sounds like a good you know horror movie, but I don't know where they're getting that from. The hat man is very unique. He's, yeah. he's different. And because I haven't had too many experiences with him, he's still a little bit of an anomaly to me. But with you saying, I, you know, I wonder if he is like, the business man, like he comes with the briefcase and it's the literal signing of the contract. He's like the accountant for the spirit world. The, you yeah. know, he deals with all the paperwork and, you know, he, he, he fulfills contracts and he chases people up. You know, he's the bailiff, you know, he's knocking on people's doors at nighttime. It's like, you need to pay up. You owe us money type of thing. He's that guy, you know what I mean? <laughs> Cause he, yeah. it, it feels like he was, again, it was all very, he was serious about the situation. He's like, I've not forgot about our conversation. I'm coming now on the phone, on the phone to me. You know what I mean? He's like, it's like, uh, and he was sinister. It was all sinister, you know? Yeah. I, I, I just thinking about it in a whole new light. Now you've said this whole contract, this, cause everything was there, the food, you know what I mean? The consummation of the whole thing that this whole, I made a deal at some point in the, and this was years ago. This is before I was saved. You know what I mean? This was during the time 
I think 2014 or something, something like that. It was around the time when I was just getting to know God and Christ. You know what I mean? It always just stuck with me. I think I made the video explaining it all in like 2015 after the fact. Yeah, you know, I I don't feel like I'm beholden to any contracts now since the Holy Spirit's come into it. I think it was something else. It was during a, t a different time of my life where I had different aspirations. Do you know what I mean? I, I wanted to be a musician in many ways and I wanted to be an artist. You know, I was in the creative world and my my goal was to have a career in the creative industry. So I think it was a reflection of something like that. Maybe it was their way of, of giving me, uh, trying to elevate me. Maybe they thought I'd be useful to them because I was in the new age psychedelic world at the time. I don't know, but uh, nothing came of it and he didn't get me in the dream in the end. You know, I, I don't know what it was supposed to be, but... My own research since obviously being saved in this whole series I do about clowns. The Hat Man is a prolific figure in the circus. He's the ringmaster. He's the, he's the one who orchestrates the ritual. He's the one who dictates the performance of the clowns, the demons, you know. He's kind of like a high-ranking official within the circus, the fractal realm, which they all reside in a, a symbolic sense. The Hat Man is also the grand worshipful master of any Freemason lodge. He's the only one allowed to wear a black top hat. You know, he is the Hat Man. Hence why it's a metaphor in the circus to be the ringleader. You know, that's that's what it is. It's a it's a Masonic ritual, is a circus performance, you know, and it's reflected in that. So the, the yeah. Hatman itself is is a um, Papa Legba and Baron Semadi in the um the Vodou religions of Haiti, you know, and the Haitian Vodous, which is based on African ancestral worship of Legba as well, um, the god Legba. Uh, he has a top hat specifically with a, a skeletal face and has a snake around his neck, you know, and people dress like that to summon him and get be possessed by the top hat wearing entity. There's something about this entity, you know, it's not a, it, it has a specific look and a, a job. It has a job, you know, in a role, a very specific role. And it's, it's an orchestrator. It's a leader of some sorts. It's like a lieutenant in the army of the demons. It's a, it's not a high, a highest ranking demon. It's not like the devil or anything, you know, or Beelzebub or Azazel or whatever. It's not, it's not like a, an angel. It's, it's just something a little bit above the demons, I think. I mean, and more like, pra more practical. Like, I don't think its job is necessarily to scare people. I think people just get scared because it's of its presence and its demonic nature. But in my dream, in my encounter, it was all business to him. That's what it felt like now. It was a transaction and it was to the T. It was timed perfectly. Right, he's drank the tea, call him. You know what I mean? He's just signed the contract in a way type of thing. You know what I mean? It's like, I, yeah, I don't know. I'm, my mind's reeling. I'm just, I'm just yeah. trying to like. Well, I, I want to, I want to speak to your comment too, where you said, I don't feel like I'm in that contract any longer. And this is a good place to, to, to sit for a moment because there are a lot of people who have, you know, gotten themselves into these contracts and feel like, how will I ever know if they're broken or how do you break them? And so absolutely they can be broken. And this is where I think the whole Revelation 320 metaphor is completely misunderstood. So we'll go into vampire lore for a moment. When, when a vampire is given invitation and his foot crosses the threshold, there are only two ways out of that invitation, out of that contract. You can die because death breaks all contracts. We know that till death do us part. Marriage is a covenant. And what breaks the covenant? When one of the spouses dies. So if you die, the covenant is null and void. The only way to break a, a astral covenant and live is that the ownership of the home must change hands. Now, we're not talking about our house because we're in a spirit realm here in the dream world so what does it mean to have the um, deed of your home change hands this is the whole metaphor of salvation and it's been dumbed down and it's the spiritual nature that's been taken out but what's basically happening when jesus says i'm standing at the door and knocking and what do you what do you mean? That's Revelation three twenty and Psalm ninety one nine when he says, "Those who have made Yahweh their dwelling place." That is a stepping over the threshold and dwelling in his tent, which is a betrothal covenant. And you also have these images of um, inviting Jesus into your heart, and how our heart is Christ's home. That's kind of like a, a Christian thing, like my heart, Christ's home. 
you also have the imagery of um our bodies are now at the temple of the holy spirit you know there was a physical temple in the old testament and now that christ has died and we have the holy spirit that our bodies are the temple of the holy spirit so when we invite jesus into our heart we're he's dwelling in the temple right so what's happening and this is why the apostle paul uses this language he compares the salvation experience to dying a physical death yes and being raised to life as a completely new creation in christ mm -hmm. why he's using that language is because he understands that the only way to break off and nullify every covenant that we have made through sin and through the flesh with these entities is that if we die and the ownership of the home the temple changes hands when we die and all the covenants are broken and we are raised as a new creation in christ he now possesses that deed he's the owner of the home he's the doorkeeper now if anyone wants to recross that threshold there's another layer of protection between us and them. There's a guy that answers the door on our behest and says, get out. And so salvation isn't just about, hey, life kind of stinks and, you know, I don't want to go to hell and Jesus wants to be my buddy and he's going to help me at work and help me in my marriage. This whole idea is this is the only way Jesus could null legally nullify contracts that we signed our names to is by our spiritual death and then inviting him to be the new keeper of the deed so all of the language even um the language of salvation it is all contractual it's all covenant if we don't understand blood covenants salt covenants threshold covenants betrothal covenants if we don't understand covenants we can't understand the Bible, period. Excellent. Right. Well, that's a wonderful place to stop. I think <laughs> that's, a, that's a good place. And um, we've been going for a good hour, 43 minutes now. So before we hit the two hour mark, um, do you want to tell the guys what you've been up to and what you're working on currently and where they can yep. listen to more of your work, if that's okay? Yep, absolutely. You can find me at VickiJoyAnderson.com and there's a list of all my books that I've written there. Uh, you can find every podcast I've been on and what conferences I'm speaking at. You can send me an email. You can get me on Instagram at VickiJoyAuthor. My book, They Only Come Out at Night, Exposing the Dark Weapon of Sleep Paralysis, is available exclusively at LAMarzuli.net. And I am just working right now on writing. I'm working on my next book. This one is going to probably delve into the um, idea of AI, but it's not going to go in the cliche directions. If, if you've read it online, it's not the direction I'm going. Um, I've been praying and fasting and believe that the Spirit of God revealed some really amazing links to the gods of antiquity. And I think it is going to be... Um, really interesting so uh keep your eyes peeled for that and pray for me if you feel so uh compelled because i'm actually um on a writing lead this this month and, and working on that even as we speak that sounds very exciting um i talked to the bump Cod podcast is it is it bo is that his name Bo. yeah yes i talked to him yesterday um and he told me to relay to you that he would like all three of us to get together and have a talk on his podcast at some point Beautiful, okay, beautiful. So that's <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, and obviously I got in touch with him through you. I think I think you recommended Bo and I mean get in touch. So I, I was on his podcast, and um, you can actually listen to that on my live show. I recorded it yesterday, but he's going to put that on his podcast soon as well. If you want to listen to it on on his uh, platform, um. So yeah, we need to communicate with each other and see if we can get something going there as well. Um. But thank you very much for for rambling with me i appreciate that vicky and um, we'll have, we'll have to do it again sometime i think we've hit quite a lot of interesting points today i think pe people like it so uh we'll leave it there um you hang about i'm gonna shut the stream down thanks for listening everybody and obviously as always god bless <laughs>